Violets are among the most familiar of wildflowers, at least by name and reputation. They belong to the small group of flowers after which we sometimes name our children. And even those who might have difficulty in recognising them in the wild uh, will be familiar with their more flamboyant garden relatives, the pansies, which are violets in all but name. Now, violets are among the classical zygomorphic families with flowers that have bilateral symmetry that determines in advance where the visiting insect will land and how it will move as it probes for nectar. The ancestors of the violet, so we're talking about maybe 30, 40 million years ago, the ancestors of the violets had radial symmetry, like buttercups, for example, with five equal petals. But during the long course of their evolution, uh, the shapes of the petals and their positions within the flower have changed to give us the classical characteristic and very distinctive floral blueprint of the violets today. So the flower still has five petals. You have two petals at the top which are flag petals which are sort of waving their arms to attract visiting insects. And then at the side you've got these two wing petals which corral the insect to the centre of the flower. But the biggest and most conspicuous petal is this fifth lower one, which provides a landing pad for visiting insects at the front. And at the back, it's prolonged into a spur or pouch that contains abundant nectar. One of the most striking features of the landing pad is this pattern of nectar guides, a series of darker lines against a paler background, converging on the throat of the flower where the nectar is concealed out of sight. In the centre of the landing pad, at the entrance to the nectar spur, there is a deep groove, can you see? Which directs the bee's tongue down into the nectar-filled spur. If we take a bee's eye view of the entrance to the flower with a hand lens, you will see what looks like an eagle's beak peeping out. The orange structure you're looking at is formed by five scales, one at the tip of each anther, which narrow and converge towards a beak at the top. This downward curved green tip of the beak is the style. You will see the way the cone of anthers is positioned immediately above the landing platform. And dry pollen is released into the cylinder formed by the anthers around the style. At the bottom of each of the two lower anthers is a prominent flap or fleshy lobe that extends down into the spur. These are the nectaries. The flower is now ready to receive visitors. The bee alights on the landing platform and, following the instructions of the converging nectar lines, probes into the nectar-filled spur. The style projects beyond the cone of anthers and blocks the entrance to the flower. So as the bee reaches in towards the nectar, its tongue guided by that groove in the centre and the hairy pads on either side, it cannot avoid touching the hooked and deflexed style and then pushing it up. When the bee's tongue enters the spur, it separates the two nectary flaps, in the process of doing so, opening the anther cone. And when it does this, pollen falls on the upper surface of the proboscis. When the bee's head exerts this pressure on the reflex style, a small drop of liquid is exuded through the tip of the style. Then, when the pressure is released, this liquid is drawn back into the tubular cavity of the hollow style, sucking up with it some of the dry pollen on the bee's head. Pollen will only germinate within this cavity, and very little seed is set in the absence of visits from bees. But herein lies the violet's dilemma. Because violets evolved in a warmer world where bees were varied and abundant. And during the long course of their evolution, they became highly specialised for pollination by bees. Now, all is well where there are lots of bees. 
But when or where bees become scarce, cross-pollination becomes difficult or even impossible. And this is why violets have developed a plan B. But to see what that involves, we'll have to come back later in the summer.